Hey, thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Lawyers on the Rocks. The Lawyers on the Rocks are Jeremy Eldridge, me, Kurt Nachman, and Adam Crandall. We are hosted by Gideon at Up Next Creative. Um, you can check us out online at lawyersontherocks.com, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, email us at lawyersontherocks at gmail.com. And today, we actually have a special guest from Checker Spot, Checker Spot Brewing Company. We've got Dennis Nash. Um, Dennis has, has uh, graciously um, provided us the Dan Meritzen, uh traditional German amber lager, and also Robe Life Double IPA, the recent releases by Checker Spot, which is a local brewery, um, and we'll jump right into that. But in the meantime, sit back, relax, pour yourself a drink until... And enjoy this episode of Lars on the Rocks. Wow, that intro was terrible. How many? Thank you. How many? Look, I know. Did you partake in before we went live? Not enough. Seriously, guys, I know I went to court today because I'm the only one that's dressed professionally here, and I'm still on my way back from court. But you guys sound like you've been drinking all afternoon while my ass was working. Do you guys hear something? I don't know what that is. What is that? So, I mean, Kurt's so sitting there weird. stuttering. I mean, that was like the worst you, stead advisement of all time. This is horrible. Did you notice that Jeremy shrank? Actually, he looks taller to me. <laughs> it, it is a tall boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you did you know, there. We're going to turn this in. It's like the Little Penny commercial. I see how it is now. <laughs> so, so, Dennis, good afternoon. Yeah, Happy Eldridge Friday. Good afternoon. Say my piece. Thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining with, us. My pleasure. It was fun hanging out with you guys the other night at the brewery, uh, including Jeremy. Surprisingly, uh, <laughs> uh, you guys, uh, you guys are a lot of fun. I almost feel like I should uh, get cards from all of you just in case I get in trouble because <laughs> you guys obviously have the same issues I do, like to drink. So I appreciate you inviting <laughs> us on and uh, spotlighting us as a brewery. Um, the uh, the Dan that you're trying right now was inspired by our electrician when we were building this place. Dan was here 14 hours a day. And he oddly looks like, I don't know if you know, he looks like Jerry Garcia. <laughs> I don't know if I took notice of that. But uh, he, uh, he's been a champion of helping us out, like putting in coolers and things like that. So we decided to name a beer after him. Pretty much around here, anytime you do something fun, you end up with a name or a beer named after you and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, you mentioned, so l let me back up a little bit. How long has Checker sure. Spot been around? We opened in June of 2018, um, so we've been around almost three years. And uh, and where are you located? We are at 1399 South Sharp Street, so we are pretty much caddy corner from M&T Bank Stadium. So we're on the uh, like the west side of uh, federal or east side of Federal Hill, rather. Okay, cool. And um, I, I I will admit that we did uh, enjoy your outdoor space the other day. Uh, tell our listeners about your COVID friendly uh, uh, accommodations. <laughs> Absolutely. Our, our head brewer um, has a lot of insight to science, having a doctorate from Hopkins Bloomberg. And so we have uh, UV lighting, air filtration systems for inside if you want to be inside. But we also have a ton of space outside that's covered by 395, uh, which inspired us to name our Kolsch under the over because you can pretty much come and tailgate underneath an overpass if it's raining it doesn't matter you're going to stay dry so it's been great for us it's uh believe it or not in covid we've actually found we uh we we've grown uh as a result of having you know the space outside which is safe and we pretty much spread tables as far apart as we can and people come and bring their chairs and hang out all day it's a great experience yeah i want to i want to shout you guys out dennis and and I, you know, we talked about this the other day. I'm a resident of the neighborhood. I live in Federal Hill. Uh, so we're, we're neighbors. And uh, this fall, Checker Spot was a lifesaver for so many people in the neighborhood, a place to hang out outside, bring their families, um, drink great beer. And, and I did want to help out with the, the location situation for all the county folks out there who only know Baltimore by reference to M&T Bank Stadium. Checker Spot <laughs> is across the street from Lot H. <laughs> <laughs> we are a tailgate. Every, all of our it. listeners just went, oh, shit, I know right where that is. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, damn, who knew it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, 
it's funny uh, being so close to the stadium. We thought that we would, uh, you know, sports would be the thing for us. And COVID totally changed our mentality about it. Now it's like, let's do fun shit. Like, you know, I've had comedy shows in a parking lot. People are sitting underneath the 395, sitting in their camp chairs, paying money, drinking our beer and having a good time at a time when there's nothing to do. So it's been awesome. I uh, surprisingly find them like a, I joke around and say I'm like a local celebrity sort of, or the mayor or something. Cause every time I walk around somewhere, like you're the guy that did this in the parking lot, you do that in the parking lot. I'm like, well, I didn't do it, but yes, we do do that. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. How long have you been with checker spot? Uh, I started in April of 2018. I was with uh, Waverly Brewing and I met Rob and Judy and Steve, the owners, uh, as a bartender there. And uh, they wanted me to manage Waverly, but there were too many partners. It wasn't quite my thing. So I was like, you know, uh, they offered me an opportunity to come in and run the tap room and events. And I was like, I'm going to jump on the opportunity. And uh, it's been a great run so far. So I uh, was part time for a few years. And then back in July, I came back full time. And that's when we started doing some more fun outside the box thinking and crazy stuff in COVID. That's cool, man. I, I love hearing all these stories. So like, you know, we've had a few different um, uh, spirits companies and breweries on the show. And I love hearing about innovative thought in it's thinking outside the box, trying to make your business work during COVID. And, you know, you guys are definitely on the forefront of that. And I really appreciate that. So along those lines, I mean, I'm going to jump in here. So tell, tell us, uh, Dennis, you were telling us the other day about the can line and oh, sort yeah. of the, the, the shortened time frame on getting that in right, I guess, right at the beginning of COVID for distribution. Yeah, we were doing bar distribution kegs because that's what you do. We're, you know, our goal was initially was to put our beer in bars, have people find our product, you know, get excited about it, come to the tap room and drink, you know, things that they can't get in their local bar. But COVID changed that. So we basically, we had a plan to can maybe a year later than we started. But with COVID, there was no better opportunity or it was a necessity actually, because you can't survive on selling carry out when you're selling pints. People don't walk around drinking beer uh, or they can't, you know, if they, if they can't hang out or can't stay. So it was a bit of a gamble, um, but it's paid off. We've been very fortunate. We have a few, uh, well, we have a, actually we have a lot of liquor store partners that are really good to us and uh, keep us in the forefront of things. And that's all I can ask for. You know, it's uh, it's been phenomenal uh, for the brand and and ac access to the brand. You know, if you have a local liquor store, you you know, and you like our beer and they don't have it, ask them for it. You know, it's funny. Liquor store owners will always bend over backwards to keep the customer. And we kind of understood that. And we've been very fortunate. They've been so good to us. Well, and, and, and the can line too, I think has allowed you guys to, uh, to get some of the incredible artwork that when you go to the brewery, you know, you can see the posters that you guys do for, for all the different beers, but then, uh, with the cans, everybody gets to see it at home too. And, and some of the artwork is, is really fucking cool. Oh, Adam is a fucking beast, dude. He is, uh, one of Robin Drew's very dear friends, uh, you know, we just released a beer yesterday, or on, yeah, yesterday called Stoop Sesh, and uh, I'm sorry, on Tuesday, and it's basically a session IPA. It was inspired by South Baltimore, where everyone hangs out on the stoop and drinks. You know, but his artwork, he came to me. He's like, I want to do something that's going to be is like kind of cool, like my three sons inspired. He's always got these great ideas, and every one of his labels just fucking kick ass. Does like, Jean Claude Van having... Damme beer? Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, John Claude Which Van Damme. Which is my is favorite bad. of all the beers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's available in stores now. Finally, we took a long time to get that out in distro, but yeah, it's pretty popular. It's pretty badass. When you got now, yeah. before Go you move on, just so everyone knows that that's the bourbon barrel aged beer, but they serve it in a Jeremy size glass because I'm fun size. <laughs> so that's what yeah, I a, like when I when a, we did our little R and D the other night. <laughs> yeah it's a five ounce my like hand here. looked huge <laughs> exactly my hand looked monstrous <laughs> holding the glass it, which is basically the way i like it when i'm drinking <laughs> well you want all the ladies think you got big hands and whatever you know the rules <laughs> you're jewish but you gotta yeah. find ways you know that's why i'm a lawyer <laughs> i'm irish so tell I us, you represent me <laughs> tell us dennis tell us a little bit about robe life so robe life um 
is a double IPA that's been brewed with Callista, Citra, and Mosaic hops. And the whole idea of this is it's a double IPA, so it's going to be a little bit higher in alcohol. It's 8.3%. The can looks really good. I'm actually going to get this in the Four Seasons because if you live in the Four Seasons, shouldn't you be living the robe life? I mean, you're being spoiled, right? <laughs> I'm really not joking. <laughs> That's actually going to happen. Um, <laughs> we, we, we were talking about in COVID, like, there's nothing to do, right? Most people are sitting home just getting fucking hammered. So we're like, let's come up with a beer for people who just want to stay home and get hammered. So we're like, all right, let's do a double IPA. They're a little lengthy on the alcohol and things like that. And uh, somewhere along the line, just in brainstorming, some of those, let's call it Robe Life. And it took off. And somebody put together the artwork. And it's, <laughs> it's been a really popular seller for us. So one last one last question that came from Gideon. Gideon, you want to jump in on the on the celiac tip? Yeah. So um, I I've had quite a few of your beers because um, one of our neighbors uh, really likes your beer in particular because her sister has to drink gluten free, and and so they get your beers which are gluten removed. And I, so I'm curious. Can you tell us a little bit about? Um, why your beer is gluten removed a little bit about the process and then how that affects the flavor of the beer. It, it actually has no impact on the flavor of the beer. Um, there are some natural, I guess I would say like yeast like strains or something. I'm not exactly a scientist here. I'm actually like a grunt here, but uh, the whole idea is there's an additive that we can put into it that will totally get rid of or reduce gluten down to almost non-traceable um judy our brewer our brewer her husband also one of the owners is a celiac and he can drink our beer all day and i'm like how in the hell is that possible like give the dude a piece of bread he's shitting himself i'm like come on it's <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah, what else can i say it's like but yeah it, there there's a process that can be done um and it's not very expensive but it's a huge bonus because i think um as we go forward, unfortunately, this is something that a lot of people have issues with. And, you know, my whole, our whole goal is to appeal to as many people as possible and anything we can do to make it more attractive for them to drink our beer. That's what we've got to do. And that's one of the things we've done. And I think it's definitely paid off. I mean, people do appreciate that aspect of it. Yeah, no, I, I, I just wanted to say uh, again, you know, as, as a, a neighbor, um, I really appreciate what you guys have done for the neighborhood, for all the listeners out there, whether, you know, if you're in the city, come down to Federal Hill, uh, there's, there's parking, not that you should be drinking and driving, but if you do, you should call Jeremy, uh, but there's plenty <laughs> of parking. Um, it's an easy in and out, you know, off of 95, you guys have got a great location there right by the stadium. And it's a super fucking awesome place to hang out and drink good beer. So all the listeners should definitely. Adam, I got to add one thing, which is just, we had a great time there the other night celebrating something pretty wonderful. And uh, while we were there, we got to meet the brewmaster. And, you know, Kurt, you're, the brewmaster had a little dog and Kurt asked her how old the puppy was. And the puppy was like 14. So that, I think my favorite <laughs> portions of the night were Kurt assuming that the size of a dog relates to the dog's age. Uh, <laughs> If that were the, the way, case, Jeremy, you'd be palm twice. readings as well. <laughs> exactly. But I, I just yeah. like how laid back the atmosphere was. You had a bunch of shock trauma nurses hanging out outside. You know, I think you can tell, you know, everyone's kind of going there to relax. And Adam, every time he talks about it, talks about how kid friendly it is. So I know they don't card kids either, which is a really no. good thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we serve them straight up. <laughs> That's why you're my attorney, <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> no, um, we're also very dog friendly. We've been voted most dog friendly brewery in uh, Baltimore City, oh, I do believe. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. So, <laughs> so de well, we we had a our our internet connection is unstable. It's warning me uh, right now. It's us on it's our us end. on our end. So, oh, okay. um, Dennis, can you give the listeners before you jump off? Can you give the listeners kind of the hours and when people can come check out the brewery and come down in person and you know what what the scoop is? Absolutely. We are open Monday through Wednesday, 3 to 9. We're open Thursday, 3 to 10. Friday and Saturday, noon to 9. Sunday, noon to 6. Uh, we have a private 
party space upstairs. If anybody's looking to book a party or wants to have a little gathering, as limitations start to get lifted on spaces, you know, reach out to me. I'd be happy to hook anybody up. We have a lot of fun here. There's nothing better than like we had a party before COVID. We had a hundred dudes in green dresses drinking beer, running around the city. <laughs> so we'll do just about anything. Nice. <laughs> We're in it for the fun. We want an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, well, well listen, man. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was gonna say I appreciate you guys having me on. I know it's, uh, I appreciate you guys coming by and the support, and I really, really appreciate that uh, you guys are focusing on small local things. We appreciate it. You know, it's uh, this is a labor of love. We work a lot of long hours, and we blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, it's nice to hear that people appreciate it. So I, that's that's great for me. I really am glad that we did this. I appreciate you guys reaching out. Thank you. Dennis. Cheers, Dennis. Cheers, man. Cheers. Have Jer a good day. Jeremy, gentlemen. don't drink and drive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeremy, dude, I hate you can you represent so yourself. Much right now. <laughs> you can represent yourself. No, I'm going to find a way to represent you so I end up with a Jeremy beer. I want the Jimmy, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we've got it. We're, we're coming out with a um, Brewer's Fantasy Camp. If you want to have your own beer, you can, you can, you can buy it. I am for sale. I'm a hooker with a heart, brother. <laughs> I mean, that, that sounds pretty wonderful. You just have to hug me afterwards. Nice. I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be vaxxed next week. I'm good. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you guys so much again. It's been a blast. Thanks, Dennis. Good have stuff, a great Dennis. day, Thanks, man. man. You too. Bye. So, uh, folks, I'll be checking the feed. Everyone, get off the road. Jeremy's already a horrible driver, and now he's on Zoom and driving. So, Which, by uh, the way, I think is a misdemeanor. Is that what I'm hearing in the background? Is your phone? No. Oh. You're hearing Jeremy's oh, driving. Echo on Jeremy's driving. Uh, listener Katie says, <laughs> Adam, add it to the list of beers you need to bring to me. Done. And beer art, you are speaking my language. A Adam, Understood. you have so many requests now to take to Katie that I don't think you're going to have space in your car for anything but alcohol. Like you're gonna have to leave the kid. I mean, that's that's fine. Take the alcohol with you. Yeah, that's fine. You would think North Carolina trip. is like Antarctica. <laughs> so we did want to jump into our regular stories. And speaking of Jeremy driving, the next story has to do with pseudo public figures engaging in bad driving on, in this case, South Dakota highways. Adam, you sent over the story. Yeah. I did a little bit of follow-up reading. This is the Ravensburg story. Oh, South Carolina AG under pressure to resign. Dakota, Dakota, South Dakota. South Dakota, what'd I say? South Carolina. It's a Freudian slip. You, you feel sexual about the Carolinas? <laughs> yes, <laughs> often um so wait what do you want me to do you want me to do this story no i'm gonna talk about Damn the legal it, i'm gonna talk about the legal it? tip you you are gonna talk about what happened to attorney general or soon to be former attorney general ravensborg raven Ra rap and wait first of all so the guy's name is ravensburg ravensborg there's no e though but there's no e he's like he's literally the raven that's not knocking at the door well the good news is when he loses his job as the attorney general of south iowa or whatever fuck south he is um, he can come work for us because he has the appropriate lack of uh, vowels in his name. Um, I'm pretty sure he was the attorney general of South Baltimore, by the way. <laughs> the Sobo AG. No, that's Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dennis, for coming on, by the way. All right. All right I'll, so I'll, South Dakota attorney general. What did he do? He fucked up. That's what he did. And now he's under pressure to resign as new evidence reveals that he fucked up because that's what he did. South Dakota Attorney General Jason Ravensborg. Ravensborg is under pressure to resign after he was charged last week with three misdemeanor counts in an accident that led to the death of a 55-year-old man named Joseph Bover, who I think stole all of Mr. Ravensborg's vowels. His last name is spelled B-O-E-V-E-R. There's an extra vowel or two there. The calls for his resignation have ramped up in light of new evidence released Tuesday night. What evidence, you ask, Kurt? Evidence that investigators say they found in Boever's 
broke. They found his glasses inside the car of Ravensborg. Is everyone following me? No. Gideon looks confused. So is this article not really the backstory? This was written by CNN, <laughs> by the way. They clearly do not edit their stories for style and content. So the one you sent over was written by the New York Times. It was a much more finely written piece, but it was like three weeks ago. So you chose to go with this no, one? No, I went with an updated story because uh, some of the facts and circumstances had changed since the um, since the original New York Times All right, story. so let's wrap this out. So basically, Attorney General of South Dakota hit a dude no, while no, no. driving. Well, well, so let's let's back up a couple steps further. So he was on his way home from a fundraising event, okay? And as Jeremy Eldridge well knows, fundraising events are often sober. accompanied by- They're very sober. What, They're Jeremy? Sober. Lawyers on the rocks. Exactly. Mm. So there's lots of lawyers, doctors, uh, other people of financial means, spending money on politicians, as well as booze. Um, but Mr. Ravensborg claimed in his initial interview to police that he was not consuming any alcohol. And of course, he was not apprehended at the night, uh, the night of the incident or until the next day or until a couple of days after. So there's no way to really tell what his blood alcohol content was, if any, um, on the date and time in question. So he was driving home from this event and he hits a speed bump in the road. No, a human. Okay. Mr. Boaver, who stole, who not only died, but stole all of his bowels on his way to the grave. Well, it didn't you know, work I, the second time either. I'm going to keep trying. So the guy hits the car. So, so one of two things had to have happened, right? He, uh, the guy, the victim, Bo Boover, Boover, Beauregard, um, <laughs> leaves his glasses inside the vehicle so either his his head went through the vehicle through the windshield and 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 ravensborg pulled the guy out of the car and then left him on the side of the road to die or ravensborg got out of his car saw someone on the road grabbed the glasses as a souvenir maybe i don't know but whatever it is he got in his car, he drove home, and he called the cops the next day. Wait, so this was after he was pulled over and then released? Never, got, never, pulled, never over. got pulled over, never got caught the night of the incident. This this happened, well, so, and that's the other thing that's a little bit unclear. You know, I'm picturing South Dakota, th this is occurring, like, in some field somewhere with, like, Buffalo nearby. I don't really know. I mean... And, and it doesn't really say um, it, Mr. Bover was later discovered to be in a ditch. That could be on a divided highway or that could be a cornfield ditch. I don't know. Listen, this article. I'm going to tell y'all what happened because y'all are missing this. He hit the guy, he dragged him into a field. He went back to the street. He found the guy's glasses, was worried someone was going to drive by, picked up the glasses, got in the car and drove off. This I mean, why that's I'm a, a criminal defense attorney. That's a theory. What I was going to say was this story really illustrates the two points of drinking, the, the two most Im important uh, things to remember when drinking and driving. Number one, don't get caught. He wasn't pulled over, so no one knows if he was actually drunk, right? And number two, don't hit someone else. It's funny you mentioned that. So I actually, I had a conversation with a client who was accused of a pretty horrific car accident, but no one else was hurt other than my, my client. And not to say that it, it doesn't matter that there was an accident, but if you only hurt yourself, a judge is not going to be anywhere near as pissed off as if you hurt someone else yeah. with, through your own mm -hmm. behavior. Um, so what, what I thought was interesting about this case, besides the political angle was the kind of fact that like how pseudo celebrities get treated when they're involved in auto accidents. I mean, I can think of a few former senators that were involved in a very serious auto accident with a young lady in their car. There's been several documentaries about that incident. Um, and they all seem to get treated a little bit differently. Um, Mr. Uh, Ravensborg uh, indicates that he does not intend to resign. 
Um, nothing has impeded his ability to do work at the office. Um, so, Kurt, while we're while we're talking about this subject of political figures and pseudo celebrities, I, I have to assume, and and I'm sure any police officer would contradict me, despite the fact that this is my assumption, that they would have a reluctance to say decide to arrest a an attorney general or a state's attorney or a senator. They would probably sort of hand wave them away. depending on the depending on the infraction right like if if you were suspected of maybe drunk driving and and you weren't like in danger of necessarily killing someone at least from the vision of what the officer saw they might just hand wave that away is is that a a poor assumption on my part or do we think that's Um, largely somewhat true i i i think the issue is the level of evidence that's typically required in a case like this okay so let's just assume that mr ravensborg was intoxicated there's no proof of it there's right. just none right so even if he was intoxicated the state's never going to be able to prove it um this ha- must have happened in some sort of remote area because um the victim mr bover wasn't found until you know the next day um re- on ravensborg's own reporting of the incident so when you're involved in a situation like that you know there's a couple of things that you're going to have to show like if it's a vehicular manslaughter at least in Maryland, you have to demonstrate that the operation of the motor vehicle was negligent to the point where it was criminally reckless. Okay. And so they would need an accident reconstructionist. They'd have to show that his driving was what caused the accident, not, you know, somebody stepped in front of him and got clipped by a vehicle on a dark road late at night. Right. I like to think that, that what happened is Mr. Bover, as the car was coming by, just happened to lean forward and his head went into an open window and his glasses fell off before being careened out of the car. That's what I like to think happened. No, I think Jeremy's um, uh, sort of summary of what happened is entirely possible and even probable um, where Ravensburg pulled him off to the side into the ditch and then took off running. Again, you'd have to have crime scene evidence. You'd have to have um, physical analysis of the scene and how the accident took place. They would do that through analyzing the skid marks, if any, associated okay. with the accident. If there are no skid marks, it makes it very, very difficult to calculate speeds associated with a collision. But isn't there, so doesn't that beg sort of an ethical question here, which is if the dude I mean, if anybody, but especially a lawyer and the top lawyer in the state of South Wyoming thinks that he hit someone, shouldn't he like stop, stop, call the cops, render aid, do something? I mean, isn't there there, other charges there, though? There's a crime there, too, right? Right. Yeah. So leaving the state of Maryland, it would be leaving the scene of an accident involving unattended or attended property which carries a 60 day maximum penalty. There's leaving the scene in Maryland of an accident involving bodily death, which carries, I believe three years. And there's another statute for 10 years. Um, And I think Kurt's correcting me because maybe the penalties have changed, but Maryland enacted new laws in order to deal with leaving the scene, because regardless of how bad it looks, because you can't prove the DUI, the DUI is only a one year penalty. Vehicular manslaughter obviously has different penalties, but they've a lot of these states have added companion statutes so that if you think you're getting out of jail free card, which was for, for a very long time, simply leaving the scene and not doing anything and getting charged with hit and run later, leaving involving body death. And they, there are sometimes the penalties there are worse than the DUIs. So what was there's, the, what happened? Well, the story's ongoing. He has not resigned. There were articles of impeachment that were drawn up. Um, he was charged with what what they're characterizing as three misdemeanors, but they don't, of course, this crappy CNN article doesn't specify what misdemeanors there are. Um, he did give a blood sample the day after with a zero zero uh, uh, BAC through a blood kit. Well, I think I think the shady shit going on here, though, kind of gets to the reporting thing, right? Like, I, I mean, we, no one can prove that he was driving drunk, but it does say that he initially told police that he hit a deer. 
but then they found the glasses. So that indicates that he kind of knew, I mean, maybe the deer was wearing glasses, <laughs> which is a possibility. Mm -hmm. Like on a law school exam, that would be the answer, right? Like the deer was wearing glasses. Right. But sure. here, I mean, in South Dakota, the deer wasn't wearing glasses. It would be the state's burden to prove that the deer were not, that the deer was not wearing glasses. Yes. Jeremy could argue that to a jury. <laughs> I, I don't know about that one, guys. I mean, I, I can argue just about anything, but I, I don't know about that one. There is a lawyer in our office who I won't name today who I think argued that a squirrel threw some cocaine out of a tree. So, <laughs> I mean, anything is possible, guys. Because it did. Because it did. Because the squirrel did throw the cocaine. Obviously, if you haven't, haven't seen, seen a cocaine. squirrel, if you haven't seen a squirrel who's high on cocaine, you haven't really lived. <laughs> well, you haven't walked. Did that lawyer? Days. That lawyer got a not guilty. Yep. Yep. Squirrel justice. Squirrel. All right, let's get off of this. Let's get off this South Idaho story and move right. on. In this in this week's episode of I can't believe it's not Baltimore, a woman is linked to a burglary by the Cheeto residue on her mouth. Before we jump into this, are you ready for some robe life? Oh, I'm, I'm on the robe life. You already man. moved on. I moved on. I moved on and already moved back. I'm moving on. Shit's about to get real. We're going 8.3% ABV right now. Tulsa police said a woman is in jail after Cheeto residue on her teeth linked to an attempted home burglary. On February 26, police officers were dispatched to reports of a person attempting to force their way in through a window of a home near 51st and Sheridan. The victim was alone in the residence with two small children. So was the victim really alone if there were two children there? No. No. Yeah. How about... <laughs> There was the homeowner and two children in the residence. This clearly was not written by the BBC. Fucking same assholes in CNN. It wasn't the BBC. No, this uh, is KT, KTUL. Jesus. She told 911 that a person was breaking through a window. Could be any window. <laughs> Officers arrived quickly, found an open window with the screen removed on the front of the house. And a few seconds later, they saw Sharon Carr come out of the shadows and arrested her. Carr allegedly pried the screen off using a board. Then she entered the home through the window. But before stealing anything, she left. Officer said the suspect, she said she was spooked when she heard the residents in the house. Officer said they found an empty Cheeto bag and a bottle of water on the floor of the house near the open window. They believe Carr dropped the Cheeto bag in the water as she made her escape. The victim identified Carr as a burglar after seeing her. She was further linked to the crime by the Cheeto residue on her teeth. That's Not on her fingers? See, that that's where I have the problem. I, on I'm, her teeth? What did she bite teeth. the screen? Like, I wanted this story to be cool it's cool, but like, I wanted it to be cooler because I wanted her everybody to have, gets the Cheeto residue on their fingers. Yeah, like you don't even have like you don't have to dust for prints. They've already been dusted with Cheeto dust. <laughs> if she was just dumping them into her mouth. I mean, that she would be a, that's a smart criminal move. If you're gonna break into a house, don't finger the Cheetos out of the bag, go straight to the mouth. Just you need chopsticks. <laughs> <laughs> the that defense there would have been nacho cheese <laughs> like not your i'm dropping dad jokes all day here this is what's, well, what happens when i'm not drinking on a drinking podcast guys the second part of it is she needed energy to be able to go in there burglarizing takes a lot of fucking physical labor more so than, than a lot of other crimes she had to climb in the window she had to pry the thing off that thing would, I mean, a Snickers is probably a better snack there, maybe to leave a nice chocolate print, but like, it's tiring, man. Have you ever climbed in and out of a window? Let me and ask you a question, off? Jeremy. It's an important question. Has this happened in Baltimore? <laughs> no. Why? Definitely. Why don't you take a test in the jungle? Why? Because there are too many cheetahs. 
This could really be the dad joke podcast here. I'm going to gonna have to rename it. I mean, that was good, but the setup was weird. <laughs> yeah, it was way too long of a pause. There was way too much of a dramatic pause there. It was a good dad joke. So did it happen in Baltimore, gentlemen? Probably. What do you guys think uh, the snack of choice would be before B and E and in Baltimore would be though? They would be hot Cheetos. Snickers. Yeah. I'm gonna go hot I'm gonna Cheetos go, or Snickers. I'm gonna go off a little bit off the reservation here and say 7 Eleven Big Bite. You wouldn't get a good thumbprint though. I'm trying to think of other good foods. Like that that dude nacho bangers. I bet nacho bangers where they fill up the bowl with cheetos and then put like crab dip in it once again a probably good local baltimore uh, uh good baltimore one that's it it's crab chips you're right you're you kind of beat around it there it's utz crab chips yeah like i Man, sniffed the window I'm clown for my dad joke by the way i'm i'm reviewing our uh oh but okay so a cu- couple comments here uh, listener Katie says Old Bay Utz chips. I totally agree. Crab That's one hundred percent accurate. Yep. Um, real weird setup there, buddy. And uh, Law Clerk Lauren says, "Wouldn't the safari make more sense, Kurt?" I agree. I probably told that joke incorrectly. That's my girlfriend's joke. I got. I I steal them from her, so I can't. I can't claim it. Wait, what's what is Lauren nitpicking there? That cheetahs are not in the jungle, but they are. Why wouldn't? Yeah, I don't understand how the joke would Where go. You... If you're, what are you getting at, Lauren? Why don't you take a test on a safari because there are too many cheetahs? I mean, come on. Can we get some follow up on that? So, this I I must admit real quick, the stories for this episode. My favorite cases in district court or some of my favorite cases were the theft cases where people would steal and they would shove into their pantaloons like steaks Frozen steaks, frozen shrimp, um, crab legs. Oh, um, crab legs, definitely. Oh, I, I Jeremy, I, you know it would happen. And they would take one of them. One of Kurt's first cases in Harford County was a guy who stole, remember the guy who tried to wheel out a cart with like $400 in crabs? And Kurt's like, do you think this guy's going to go to jail? I'm like, fuck yeah, he's going to jail. In Harford County, you just took somebody's bushel of crabs for the weekend, you're going to fucking jail, man. Like, you don't waste crabs in Maryland. Are you sure that's not, like, one of those things that they make every, like, young prosecutor do is, like, as a joke, is, like, try a case of stolen crabs. Like, welcome to Baltimore. Yes. (laughs) If you're in Baltimore and you haven't represented somebody for stealing crabs or prosecuted somebody, then you're not a trial lawyer. No, you you're get not good a trial ones lawyer. for like definitely not. <laughs> I love when people break into homes and they don't know. For instance, we had a guy break in and steal copper wire, but he tried to climb in the. It was like the duct work that they had, and the dude got stuck in there for three days. And then when he tried to slide out, he broke his leg and got stuck there for another two. And they, the only reason he got caught is that the cops, the neighbors called the cops because they thought there was a dead cat inside the house. I thought this was going to be one of those setups where at the end you're like, Kurt was going to be like, is there liability? <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, we had a listener, Peter, chime in with uh, famous Jameis Winston and his uh, Florida State. He says it was a crab leg incident. I actually remember it being uh, lobsters that he stole. No, but the I, crab I, legs. I thought they crab were legs. crab legs. Yeah. Lobsters King you crab, can't baby. shove down your pants because they're alive. I mean, the good ones are alive. Well, but what if they were alligators, though, Adam? I mean, uh, that has clearly happened in Florida. Yeah, but a Florida State guy would never be caught dead with gators in his pants. Ooh, we already good. did a Florida story where a guy got caught with a gator in his pocket. Wasn't that fucking Tiger King? Come, come on, <laughs> Jeremy, was... keep up. That's what I'm referencing. Keep yeah. up, man. Get out of the car. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's hard to drive and think and talk and be witty at the same time. It's much it's easier to just witty, sit guys. here in your office, Jeremy. I know we're in beer. Jeremy's office, by the way, folks. <laughs> I've been in his office most of the day. We're just going to leave it like this. So don't worry on Monday when you come in, it'll be fun. 
I, I don't really want to. The story is kind of funny. The next story, I kind of don't want to do it though. I think you sent this one to me. It's the cow curriculum. It's not that funny. Okay, fine. We're not doing it. It's for you're never funny. allowed to say you don't want to do a story because you choose what stories go in. Like me or Adam, I can understand it, but you're like managing editor of the podcast here. It's Instead, true. we're going to talk about Montgomery County paraeducators being accused of inappropriate sexual behavior on a Zoom call with students. Why would we not talk about that? Why would we talk about the other story and not talk about this? This is this is a great story. Go. <laughs> I'm, Jeremy, weren't you a teaching assistant in Montgomery County back in the day? No, I was a substitute teacher in PG County. Not sure there's a lot of difference there, but they didn't have Zoom. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold up. Jo uh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Can you repeat that? I was a long term. <laughs> I swear to God, he's doing that shit on purpose. <laughs> All right. Just the other day, I don't think Kurt knows this, but I swear just the other day, I was either on a call and I'm trying, it's tr I'm trying to get, I'm trying to recollect. I was on a call with Jeremy or in a consult with Jeremy where he was explain he was, he was commiserating with our client because he too was an educator before he went to law school. Did you also know that I he's been a, Jeremy's been a practicing attorney for 27 years? No, yeah, it's like 26 or 27. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I hear you tell somebody how long you either A, been in private practice or B, been a lawyer, it goes longer and longer and longer. I had no idea though that his, pa I thought he was like, yeah, I used, I taught, I was a teacher before I went to law school. And I was like, oh, that's very fucking noble. The dude sat, I mean, Jeremy, let's be real. A substitute teacher is if the phone doesn't ring by 730, you're just getting high all day. <laughs> <laughs> this is great because he can't even respond right now. <laughs> wow, this is some great TV, folks. All right. Yeah, I'm 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 just cutting all of this. It's gone. It's already on the, <laughs> the teaching it, Jeremy. Just give up. Just give up. You're he's clearly like five minutes from his house in in Howard County where there's zero cell service. Yeah. Yeah, just give up. He's sitting in his driveway. <laughs> he's like, wait, 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 wait. The Wi-Fi will pick up. Hang on. Hang on. He just hit a deer with glasses. <laughs> and all right. A teaching assistant who was seen masturbating during a video link with middle school students said he was put on administrative leave. Mark Shack said in an interview Wednesday morning, because of course, all good clients give interviews to the Washington Post, or excuse me, the Bethesda Beat, um, that he did Same not thing. know Same he thing. had been captured on video until the Bethesda Beat reporter asked him about it. I thought I was logged out when class was over. I had no clue that Zoom was still on. Why would I do that? That's my job. That's my career. I had no clue that Zoom was on. I mean, that's just crazy. He's been a paraeducator with special education students at Shady Grove Middle in Gaithersburg. A 13-second video shows Shaq look at his screen, stand up, take a few steps away, and then choke the chicken. During that time, his name appears on the screen as the host of the virtual link. After several seconds, another name comes up on the screen is taking over for the host. It was a mistake on my part. I thought I had turned off. I thought I had turned off the connection to the virtual call. I'm only human. My bad. My bad, bro. Shaq said the school system called him Monday saying he was placed on administrative leave, telling him they had misplaced his background check file. My Maybe bad. they were looking to see if I had any criminal behavior or things like that. But the district did not mention the video to him and was not aware of it until Wednesday. I'm not a pervert or anything like that. You know, like like I was just jerking off. It was just like my girlfriend's OnlyFans page. Like, I don't know. So a couple of things that jump out to me about this story so far, Kurt, is that number one, the dude, this dude should have hired a lawyer before going and spilling his guts to the reporter for the Bethesda. Beat. Shut the fuck up. Do yeah, not talk to anybody. Stop talking. Stop talking. Stop talking. 
That's number one. I mean, and that's really the most crucial point. And I feel like it's actually a shame that Jeremy dropped off the call because there's actually quite a bit to say about that. And, and we can talk about it some. Right. But I agree. before we get to that serious point, which is really the most serious, number one is, I mean, there was a 13-second video. Like, don't, don't we, like, transition? Don't we allow a little bit of transition time? Even Between non-masturbation and masturbation? Yeah, even on Zoom. Like... <laughs> What? 13 seconds my man like at least like go i don't know get a drink of water get a snack like maybe take a walk oh i thought you were saying that that was enough time for a transition in a no. short video clip no i agree <laughs> i'm okay we're we're agreeing about this yes yeah. yes my man needs to like step away from the computer you know like when you finish i mean we do we've been doing a lot more video consulting you know and, you got court You've been doing a lot of Zoom court. I mean, it's like hearing's over, boom, jerking off. <laughs> How do you shift gears like that? Because I know that I am not motivated to shift gears like that. I am not ready to, to get to that point as soon as I'm done with a client meeting. And he's not, this guy's not a young guy, right? He's been a paraeducator for 15 something odd years. 21 years. 21 years. So he's at, he's at least 40. He needs a little, he's got a, I mean, come on, Mark Shack. Like, give yourself a little space between work. I mean, Zoom and COVID has really shrunk our worlds, right? I mean, Gideon's been working from home for a year now. We've been working from home. Everybody's been working from home. But folks, if you're out there, give yourself some space. Erect some barriers. <laughs> and I would say 13 seconds between the end of your work day and the beginning of your jerk day is not enough time. And, and also, find a different device if you work with children. Those, those devices yeah. should not overlap. You need a work computer and a jerk computer. I'll, I'll keep going. Jeremy's not here. <laughs> Let's talk about that more serious point first, though, Kurt. Because you can you can comment on this. You've represented clients in in PR issues. You've represented clients who have, you know, charged with serious offenses that that garner some media attention. Maybe not to the level of the Bethesda beat, but you know, it is what it is. But talk about that. I mean, what if we could roll this back for Mr. Shack a little bit? As as an attorney, what would you have rep uh, recommended for him? shut the fuck up. That's number one. So there's a critical difference between a client giving a statement and an attorney giving a statement. An attorney typically within the bounds of reason cannot have their statement used against them. Their statements are made. They may get in, if they say something inflammatory or ridiculous or outside the bounds, they could get in trouble with the court, with the attorney grievance commission, with, with, you know, uh, there's there's some rules that we have to follow with regard to pretrial uh, publicity, but it can't be used as evidence. can't be used as evidence, substantive evidence of either a crime or a tort or whatever against us or our clients. Or in this case, I mean, this is a a an employee of a public school. So this is a government job. There would be a he would be afforded a full hearing before being fired i I, I mean you presumably generally. presumably i'm not sure if paraeducators are lumped in the same class as teachers and, right but assume you know. that he is there's a process there is due process before the government in this case montgomery county public schools can come in and take his job right well so, so this would be let's, let's talk evidence. about though uh misuse of you know computer equipment too is a potential crime sure. so i'd have to break out the statute um which i I actually looked at the other day for a client, but um, it's not, it changes periodically because it gets updated by the General Assembly and it covers a wide range of behavior on the internet as well as through connective computer devices. Um, and, you know, it may cover sort of behavior like this. And, uh, you know, other than that, I can't really for the life of me think of a crime that would be covered if someone was unintentionally 
behaving in that way. So in even de- if there are kids involved, like I, indecent, the first thing that comes to mind would be indecent, indecent that exposure it, that requires an intent. Uh, I'd have to pull up the statute. I'm, I, I, I don't know if it's a general intent or a specific intent crime. I believe it is a specific intent crime, which would mean that you would have to be um, indecently exposing yourself for the specific purpose of whatever. So if you were accidentally naked, it wouldn't matter. Right. I'd have to take a look at the statute. Or I'm if you plead weren't the doing fifth. it, I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. Or, or I mean, presumably, I mean, their child abuse statutes are written similarly, where it has to be for the intent to, you know, some some deviant sort of drive, right? Like, so so to avoid situations where you know spanking a kid or something like that. Um, I'm talking about like sex, child sexual abuse. Yeah. Or, or if you're still talking about indecent exposure, something as simple as you get out of the shower and the kid bursts into the bathroom door, that's right. You, you're not culpable there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not. It's going to take me too long to get. I'm trying to look it up on my phone. It's going to take me too long to get to it. Um, you know what? I think it's worthy. See, and this is why Jeremy dropping off the call is critical because he represents all these guys in our office. But the bottom line is, I mean, just to to sort of the easy way out here is to say that had Mr. Shaq in this case hired a lawyer, the lawyer would have very likely advised Mr. Shaq not to say my bad, which was a quote. That's that's my, I mean, my interpretation of that quote is that it's an admission to the conduct for sure. For sure. It was a mistake on my part. I'm only human. I must jerk off on Zoom calls. 13 seconds after the call ends. My bad. I'm, I'm not sure how. I, there's a lot of things to say there. None Let's of which, talk about this beer. I like it. So um, big fan of the Dan. Um, pretty easy drinking. Meritson. Um, you know, real nice, real light. Um, do P- now when you go to a bar, Kurt, because you you've got you know you're German, you pronounce it the proper way. Meritson. Meritson. I mean, Gideon, when you go and order a Marzen, do you order a Meritson or a Marzen? I, I took too many years of German not to say Meritson. Uh, see, I've never heard it pronounced that way, so I I've been ordering Marzens my whole life, and now I feel stupid. So I like the Dan though. The Dan was was very easy drinking. Yeah, it felt to me like a a really nice like late spring, early summer. Like I see, not quite hot weather, but sort of in between. Really easy to drink. Good spring beer for sure. What I would say is, um, in comparison to other similar style beers, um, it is a little bit lighter, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think sometimes you get um they they typically that style of beer they they pull it so that uh from the fermentation process so that it is um not fully fermented um and there's a huge amount of of unfermented sugars in there and it lends to kind of like a heavier mouthfeel um on the beer itself and uh you know this one didn't have that it it tasted sort of light bodied relative and not it's not a light body it's not a light beer it's not a light bodied beer don't don't get it twisted but um compared to others in the same kind of style category when you start talking about you know micros in the united states it tastes more like a german Märzen, um you know which which the germans are tough on their beer styles uh, robe life. I love the um, um, the smell. Like as soon as I cracked the can, I was like, "Ooh, um, yeah, that's a super hoppy." It's you know, it's it's hoppy, but I I don't find it like one of my problems with a lot of IPAs is how overly bitter and bitter forward they are, and this doesn't have that. I assume it's because of the um, the Citra hops that's in it, yeah, the Kalista and the Citra. Yeah. So. So little, so I used to be a home brewer, right? And, uh, and we've had guests, uh, Fred Barrett, Dr. Barrett on, um, he's a avid brewer. Um, and, and about 
eight years ago, 10 years ago, there was a huge, um, um, I don't want to call it a pl plague is probably the best word that swept through all of the hop crops in both North America and in Germany and devastated hop production throughout uh, the world. And so as a result of that, we've got all these new styles, right? And all these new hops that have become resistant to the blight that, that impacted that crop. Hmm. And so you've seen kind of this big shift in IPAs to these like super citrusy, um, super, it's, it's almost sweet, like mm -hmm. on the front end of it. Um, this does not have a bad back end taste. It doesn't have that like kind of bitterness going down, but I, I've got to admit, I'm not a fan of the super citrusy IPAs. I kind of miss the old Centennial hops, which you can't get anymore. And Cascade, I think, is another one that got wiped out. And then German Sass hops also got wiped out, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, there were specific kind of like hop strains that gave very specific beer characteristics that have gotten demolished over the years through this blight. Yeah, one thing I was going to say when um, <clears throat> when Dennis was on earlier, and I, did, I didn't get a chance to, but one thing, I, I mean, I've been going to Checker Spot for a while now and drinking their beers um, really since they opened. And I, I give them a lot of credit and I don't know how they do this. And it'd be interesting to talk to them about it, but they've got a ton of fucking beers. Like when you go yeah. in, their list is extensive and they are constantly adding new stuff. And it seems to me that they're, they do a really good job also of like, experimenting with different stuff and bringing in different hops or pairing. I'm a big fan of sours, pairing the sours with seasonal fruits. So the sour that we had on Tuesday stone fruit, yeah. had a stone fruit mm -hmm. from Boggers farm out oh, okay. in uh, local uh, Carroll County, Carroll County. Um, they do um, a seasonal, they, they did a pawpaw sort of infused, uh, beer back a year ago, which is a local, another local phenomenon, the pawpaw, which I only became aware of recently. But again, to go back to your point about the citrus hops and, and sort of the fruits and stuff, I think they do a, a really cool, a really good job. And it's really cool that they, they do these sort of experimental stuff um, with their beers. And so when you go in, you know, you're not maybe going to find that it's going to take you a little while to find that one that hits your palate, but they have so many different offerings and so many different variations and experimentations and they change out with new stuff so frequently yeah. that it's really, I mean, it's a cool brewery in that, in that regard. I, I wish we had asked him about that. Actually, I, I had thought about it and then we, we sort of kept moving through the topic of asking him what, what's the run length, you know, like how long are yeah. they brewing specific beers? Do they have any ones that they're constantly brewing? Because it does sort of seem like they're just making all new stuff and continuing to barrel through and make new stuff. No, yeah. they had a... I took a picture of their brewing system. I, um, but I'll, I'll tell you this while Kurt's pulling that up. I mean, I go there frequently enough and like the changeover is... is Look, they're not like a union where it's like you can always get a duck pen... Or, you know, like some of these other breweries that are like, they have their staple. I don't, I, you know, and, and maybe Dennis would, would correct me if I'm wrong, but they really seem to be like, just kind of, I don't want to say plowing through, but just trying different shit and throwing different shit out it, there. And it it's looked, good it looked to me like they had um, maybe six different fermenters that were about a uh, hundred plus gallons. Um, so they have the capacity to brew kind of a large volume of different beers simultaneously. Yeah. Um, so my suspicion would be that they probably have, you know, four or five staples that they run through kind of on a regular basis on two of the kettles. And then they're running, um, you know, kind of experimental stuff uh, to see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and it through, through some of the other kettles, they did a recent expansion. Um, they, their, their system is, is, fairly nice um and you know all these guys i mean it's 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 a biological batch production process mm -hmm. so they're going to go through it just like any you know if they're run by uh you know johns hopkins uh you know doctoral uh 
person. I think it's uh, Judy is the is one of the owners, and mm-hmm. and you know they're going to run through it, and they're going to be scientific about it. And it's pretty clear to me though that they do have some clean beers because mm-hmm. um, you can sometimes taste, you know, in some of the micros, the really small micros, you can taste yeast differentials. Um, you can taste off flavorings and and things of that nature and definitely don't get that from any of their product. Um, but I, I, overall, you know, I think that was the second time I've been there. Um, very impressed and, uh, definitely looking forward to another trip back. Yeah. And it really is. I can't oversell, you know, as a city resident to have a place like that, to go and be outside, you know, we, we, we don't get that very often in the city, you know, your, your tight quarters, you're cramming inside and with kids, especially it's always a, a, an issue, but checker spot for the neighborhood and for the wider community is a, a, a great, great, great atmosphere to just go and hang. It's like a giant fucking tailgate. It is so much fun. Hang out, have some beers. Go, you guys, listeners go check them out. They're, they're doing good shit. So I'm going to check out uh, BC Brewing next weekend. Hopefully we can line them up. They were on our list of, of businesses. So if anybody out there is listening knows about BC Brewing, you know, hit me up. We also have Old Line coming up. Um, we're, we, we're looking forward to having Union and Key. Um, they haven't responded to my emails yet. So if anybody's out there, you know, let us know. If anybody's out there, Jeremy. Jeremy, are you listening? Are you out there? Can All you right. hear me? Do the outro, bud. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lawyers on the Rocks. We hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed making. You can find us online, lawyersontherocks.com, Facebook, Instagram, email us at lawyersontherocks at gmail.com. Whatever it is you do, please be sure to leave a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Also, do us a huge favor. If you like the show, share a link with a friend. Um, have them check us out. Send us some drink suggestions. We'd love to hear it. Some microbrewery, macrobrewery, distillery, winery. We haven't done wine ever, but I'd be down to try. So in the meantime, sit back, relax, pour yourself a drink. Until the next episode of Lawyers on the Rocks. Thanks, buddy.